So what we, we want to talk about today is, is around uh, sort of machine ML ops or frameworks and, and there's sort of, uh, I think there are sort of three different a approaches to that. One is uh, right now uh, ML flow coming from Databricks, there's Kubeflow and, and David, since you're sort of Azure, uh, also representing a cloud service provider and their, their platform. So. Uh, what we, we want to speak about is uh, to understand the differences between the platform and where there is essentially a room for collaboration. Uh, so let's start with everyone. Can you describe in few words your platform? How did it came about? So we, who is the customer? Uh, who are you trying to target as, as your first citizen? And what are the advantages of, of what you've done? Let's start. All right. You. Thanks. Um, my name is Clemens. I am currently at Databricks, leading the product team for data science and machine learning. Um, as mentioned, I was also before at, at Google and worked on uh, TensorFlow, TFX, and also collaborated on Kubeflow. Um, so Databricks um, like, uh, really embraces open source, and as you're familiar, the creators of Databricks um, created Spark, uh, another open source project called Delta, and MLflow. And I think the impetus for MLflow was really uh, very user-driven in terms of uh, Matei, one of the co-founders, um, looked at some of the most pressing user needs in that space, right? And uh, MLflow was conceived with three components in mind. One was um, tracking. So the biggest pain point was actually like uh, data scientists and uh, researchers weren't able to track all of the work that they do for machine learning. If you're familiar with like your own workflows, in many cases you just use spreadsheets, right? So that was the biggest pain point. The second one was reproducibility, actually making your code and the environment that you used reproducible in the future. And then the third one was the diversity of the machine learning frameworks uh, from like TensorFlow to PyTorch, Scikit, SparkML, Lib, and so on, and how you lock those models and then how you deploy them. Um, so that was really the idea behind MLflow, and I think um, uh, Databricks has executed on that beautifully. The persona or like the, the user uh, this had in mind um, was first and foremost actually the, the data scientists and the researchers using these tools. But because uh, Databricks is a unified platform that actually unifies um, the different personas in this life cycle, there was always a big um, like consideration to the other personas, such as DevOps, or the people that actually own the deployment of these models. So the component of MLflow that allows you to reproduce your code more easily and to deploy the models is actually most beneficial to these uh, DevOps and product engineers who actually have to um, deploy these models. Uh, did I forget a piece, yeah. part of your question? Yeah. Good start, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tia, um, I'm Taya uh, Lampkin. I do um, open source strategy at Google and uh, have been working on Kubeflow for um, about a year now. Um, so I came here a little bit late to the game, um, and I'm sure David has a lot more context on what he was thinking about when he first so <laughs> open sourced Kubeflow. <laughs> Uh, and I'm also focusing a little bit more on like the open source um, community and collaboration aspect of Kubla as a platform. One of the things that we're really trying to address with the project um, from that perspective is uh, acknowledging that there's a huge diversity of tools and interfaces um, and standards that people are working with in the machine learning ecosystem. And we're trying to provide a way um, with a, a solid platform that um, allows people to leverage back best practices and develop standards around how to use them, um, no matter if they're using TensorFlow, XGBoost, or PyTorch, um, what exactly um, their serving looks like, um, and to also leverage some of these like underlying uh, Kubernetes um, uh, standards that have come out of that community as much as possible um, to make it easy to run machine learning um, uh, workflows uh, in you know distributed architecture. Um, and so the really great thing about Kubeflow is that um, we're trying to kind of provide a platform where people can um, integrate their favorite tools um, almost immediately um, without having to sacrifice you know some of the um, uh, the standards that they'd been working with in their framework up until that point. Um, and so David, I think we'll be able to cover some more <laughs> of the technical um, ideas behind it. Yeah, um, so uh, I'm David Ronchek. I um, uh, co-founded Kubeflow. And um, you know, just extending exactly what Taya did, but, but also interestingly extending what Clemens did, because um, Clemens, before he went to um, Databricks was the um, uh, product manager for TFX. And uh, 
I come from the Kubernetes background. I was the first non-founding uh, product manager on Kubernetes, and uh, we saw back, way back in the Kubernetes days that, that creating a container was very easy, right? You just do Docker build, Docker run, you're off to the races. Um, but taking it even one step further, uh, how do you run it in production in any way, uh, was actually quite hard. How do you distribute it? How do you restart it? You know, what sort of policies do you put in place? Um, what we saw you know, in 2017 when we got this thing kicked off was very similar experience with machine learning. So getting TensorFlow running locally on your machine, quite easy. Um, you know, it's just a Python script and you can use the SDK and, and you're off to the races. Uh, doing anything more complicated than that um, was actually quite hard. Uh, and we had come from this uh, distributed systems background where Kubernetes was you know, somewhat uh, universally uh, uh, used as a distributed um, architecture. Um, and, and literally the first thing we launched was a, a very simple CRD for getting TensorFlow up and running uh, and then connecting to that from a Jupyter Notebook. Now, Kubeflow has done much, much more than that in, in the interim, uh, but that's very much where I see uh, a, a great collaboration and, and complement between things like MLflow, which provide a data scientist a wonderful getting started experience, and connecting to the distributed systems on the back end for how you might run and maintain this over time. And those two together, I think, really are two halves of the same coin. You know, as you saw in, in Jeremy's demo earlier, you know, there's a very clear place in Kubeflow where you click a button and you're presented with the same experience that a data scientist might experience on their local laptop. And you know, I'd love to work with, um, you know, just like MLflow, uh, um, a, a great platform for giving that data scientist a wonderful getting started experience, um, but still giving them all the power of that distributed systems behind the scenes. Do you think the fact that uh, Kubeflow essentially came from Kubernetes and, and also TensorFlow by, you know, the name started with Kubeflow, uh, did that impact design decisions or the, sort of the perspective where sort of the databricks got to a different perspective because they come from potentially data science or Spark architecture or? Yeah, I'll, I'll be the first to admit we, we absolutely, you know, it, <laughs> Kubeflow is still 0 0.7 almost. Um, uh, my goal is to get to a place where a data scientist can remove the letter K from their keyboard and still use Kubeflow. They should, shouldn't even understand that it's running on Kubernetes. No cube cuddles, no cube no KF control, nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Uh, they should be presented with a data science experience. Uh, you know, very similarly, by the way, we were inspired by uh, Netflix um, with Metaflow. Uh, to be clear, Kubeflow has, uh, was named <laughs> literally by Clemens. Uh, I wanted to call it TensorNetties. <laughs> he, he called it, not TensorCube. He called it uh, Kubeflow, and I'm like, that's exactly right, because you know, remember what TensorFlow is, right? It's flowing of tensors. It's, that's why all these machine learning things have flow in the name. Uh, it is not TensorFlow specific. You know, on day zero, we had an MXNet um, uh, operator. We had a scikit operator, I believe, and um, a paddle paddle operator, if I remember correctly. I, I, either we have those now. <laughs> we certainly have them now. I don't remember exactly what we had then, but it wasn't just TensorFlow. But absolutely, there's, there's no question. Kubeflow came at it from the, hey, let's get this up and running on a Kubernetes deployment. That's not ideal. Our goal is to get to zero Kubernetes for a data scientist. Yeah, but it does seem to me like, as you, as you mentioned, there is some complementary aspect because mm, Kubeflow absolutely. is coming from uh, containers, let's orchestrate them. Data, uh, Databricks came from users, need some abstraction, need some tracking. Uh, today, it's not really sort of possible. I don't see any implementation of, of MLflow on Kubernetes and integrating with Kubeflow. Do you see that as something going forward where sort of those things coexist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, we, we take a very pragmatic approach as well to the open source community. So and Because there is some overlap, you know, Jeremy yes. showed metadata management, mm -hmm. et cetera. Yeah, so I think the, um, I if you drew the block diagram of the different components of, of Kubeflow and MLflow, I think there's certainly more area that's non-overlapping than it is uh, overlapping, right? But to your point, there are some overlapping pieces. Um, so we take a very pragmatic approach to the open source community and the users. Um, we have uh, community contributions to MLflow that make it easier to actually deploy MLflow on Kubernetes itself. And we also provide ways to package up uh, models that are locked with MLflow and deploy them as uh, uh, Kubernetes pods. Now I think the, the question of um, 
is there a opportunity for tight integration between ML flow and, and Kubeflow? I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, the question is just um, how both, like where do these contributions come from? And uh, who are the users that actually benefit and like who are, um, uh, who are asking for these types of integrations, right? Uh, because I think we, we see a lot of um, our customers and users um, who don't necessarily um, touch the Kubernetes layer, right? Because to your first question about personas, in most companies, the people who care about um, the cluster management and the, the Kubernetes deployments are not the ones that sit in the data science department and like train machine learning models, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think if, 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 that, uh, if we find the right abstraction of, uh, to David's point, is like at some point, like you shouldn't have to care about Kubernetes when you use Kubeflow, I think then the personas and the use cases also start overlapping more. You're bidding me to my next presentation, but that's okay. Uh, anyway, you also beat me to my next question, which who invented sort of the, the name Kubeflow, but uh, I, I'm you sorry, you took, the, you I, took I, this I thing out of the question, but never mind. So, uh, but you know, one, one of the things that uh, each, each one of you represents is also a managed platform and, and also David from sort of Azure. Uh, and, and we do see, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a code geek. I, I know both code bases pretty well. I've been sort of committed patches myself. Uh, and you see a lot of sort of opinionated views uh, and or platform specific views, you know. So essentially, for example, AMO flow is pretty nice when you download open source, but you want to really use it as a, as a managed offering, you go to a, a company called Databricks, okay. It is pretty nicely layered, et cetera, to, to allow uh, sort of more uh, vendors, but still it's, it's a part of a managed platform. If you want it with security and, and all that, you probably go to Databricks. And the same for, I think Kubeflow, there is a lot of uh, opinionated views around Google. There are a lot of areas in the code that say GCP, you know, and Stack and, and Google Container Engine, et cetera. Um, do you see that if someone, sort of an enterprise customer, now wants to deploy those things at scale and have issues around governance and authentication and all that, does he really, uh, can he work with open source or does he really have to go and go for the sort of managed offering? Yeah. <coughs> oh, the <geez. laughs> ah, you, um, you guys, I'll you're not nice. <laughs> you're just like leading her to the... <laughs> um, I'll be the first to <laughs> admit that I am, as an open source strategist, not the best versed in our GCP offerings, um, which is probably something that I should get more uh, well versed in. Um, I don't think that, I think that, you know, just like any open source tool like Kubernetes excel itself, you're always gonna, you know, in the enterprise need a certain extra level of support around how exactly you're implement implementing and continuing to run this at scale. Um, that could be support like on your own team, if you have a giant team that it wants to, you know, manage that for you, um, or maybe you want to leverage like the particular tooling that some cloud providers offer. Like I, so here's my my little spiel is that, you know, having um, Kubeflow running really well on on prem, um, on GK on prem, for example, makes it really easy to then deploy it to GK and then use when you want it to um, some of the Google Cloud AI features like you know, CMLE and IAM and stuff like that. So that's like, you know, at a certain point you want, might want to pull in some of the strengths of the cloud providers and, and doing some of the non-ML um, support things that you, you'll need to do when you're um, getting really serious about using this at scale. Um, but I think that like what we're trying to do at Kubeflow from an open source perspective isn't really be opinionated about any particular cloud, but instead make sure that it runs well on all the largest cloud providers um, because ultimately we want Kubeflow to become like an ubiquitous um, machine learning framework um, that runs in every data center, so. <laughs> yeah, I think echoing uh, the first part uh, that Tia said, I think any open source tool or offering will never be enterprise ready right out of the box, right? Like no open source, like you don't like it clone something and then it comes with enterprise level authentication and uh, like governance and auditing, right? Um, so I think uh, we take a pretty open approach to this. Uh, of course, Databricks provides one managed version of M MLflow that's fully integrated in the platform that provides all of these enterprise level features such as authentication, security, auditing. Uh, Databricks is deployed on multiple clouds, so it does work on AWS and Azure right now. Uh, but there's other people who provide uh, managed versions of MLflow. 
Uh, so Faculty AI is like one of those companies that takes a mouthful and provides a managed uh, offering of this. Uh, Microsoft actually um, got behind MLflow and is now using the MLflow APIs on Azure ML. Um, so there's like a, another place where this is actually provided. Uh, so we think that the like standardizing on the APIs and standardizing on the workflows is more important, such that you can actually run your workloads on a local machine and use the MLflow APIs, and then move that workload to a cloud, and the same APIs will then log to the managed version of this, right? Which gives you the portability. Um, so I think the uh, like same. I guess like same intention with uh, Kubeflow, the, the ubiquity um, of these features and APIs makes the workloads more portable, if you will. Yeah, I, you know, just following on both um, points, uh, you know, it, and not just, you know, um, uh, to, to stress, you know, MLflow, Azure devs were the ones who contributed, you know, upstream, and that, that's great. Like, we, we love that. That's what open source is all about. Uh, Azure also contributed uh, the upstream components to get in Kubeflow to like be able to call out, uh, and AWS contributed the Kubeflow components to um, uh, to getting in, to running against SageMaker. So um, I, I think the the most direct answer to your question is uh, all abstractions are leaky abstractions. Um, every platform will require some form of customization in order to work with a hosted or managed solution. Um, uh, the people who build it tend to know their platforms first and best, and they're gonna try and make sure it runs great with them. If it doesn't work great with a platform, it's never e either, and uh, I hope to speak to MLflow, I think I am, both MLflow and Kubeflow, if it doesn't work with a platform, it's not because those people are like, well, you know, they're our enemies, no. It is because literally the people who have the time to work on it either don't know about it or, um, or don't, you know, have other priorities that, that they're aware of first. Um, and both these communities would love, if, if you have a specific user requirement and can detail it, please submit an issue or a request and, and ideally some code, uh, and you know, I'm sure they would accept it. I have, I'm smiling because I have a funny story um, about a contributor who came to us, um, I think at a doc summit or maybe Kubeflow summit and said, um, I noticed that you don't have any AWS um, docs on your Google or Kuplo.org website. Um, is that because you won't accept my contributions if I if I uh, contribute docs your way? And like, why are there only GCP docs? And my answer was because you haven't contributed the AWS docs yet. <laughs> so I think there's yeah, I, there's strength in in having each uh, machine learning framework that's open source um, be portable. Um, I think that's probably the goal from both of our perspectives and. Um, and I think it's just about kind of what use case um, or what standards will emerge for the use cases that are stickiest with this community. They did, and now we have AWS stocks, so yay. <laughs> so I'll give you a slightly harder time, you know. So, uh, you know, again, I examine all those APIs, and I think that uh, I really like the abstraction of, of MMAflow towards a data scientist, but I think it's sort of missing the aspects of like, clustering and scale out and others that sort of Kubeflow is bringing. And you know, Kubeflow is, yeah, very nice, but sort of missing the, so the question is, what is the governance model of your project that allows me, if I'm coming now with an opinion, and by the way, we created our own sort of derivative, which is essentially the hybrid of the best of both. And it's not that we want to maintain our own, it's just that each one was sort of, we were missing the sort of data science perspective in the Kubeflow, and we were missing the scale from the MLflow. So, What's the governance model that if today I want to come and say, you know what, I want to change all that to, uh, are, are you going to accept that or is equals, and is there a, or is each one of, of you, you know, even in Kubeflow you have to sign this sort of Google thing before you contribute. So um, can each one talk to those, uh, to the governance model and how you're sort of essentially, you know, I, I think that every open source project if wants to really become sort of dominant, have to uh, spend time and energy on the openness thing. It's not just a, a lip service. It means that you have to actually invest engineering resource, develop interfaces, abstractions, et cetera, to be able to be a more accommodating and governance models. You know. yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, so for, for MLFO specifically, the governance model right now is, um, it's, it's basically still owned by, by Databricks. We haven't um, donated it to a foundation yet, but like we're not um, excluding that option um, like as we speak, because of, as, as you know, like Spark is like owned by a foundation, 
and Databricks is really just like a committer at this point. Um, but I think we, we have a, like a strong investment in the open source community. We have uh, developer advocates, we run uh, meetups. Uh, there's a lot of contributions that come into MLflow. So I think last I checked on, on uh, GitHub, there were like 140 um, um, contributors on MLflow and uh, only a very small fraction of that is actually from Databricks. And we get uh, significant contributions, like one, like as was mentioned, is from Azure, like they, they um, contributed the Onyx flavor. Um, we actually got a, a contribution to remotely execute MLflow projects on Kubernetes clusters, which is now merged. Um, so that was a, um, a contribution as well. Um, so we are extremely open to these contributions. Uh, we just ask in most cases if it's a significant contribution to start uh, like talking about designs and like design choices early enough because often in the open source community you see if someone uh, works on something in isolation and then just in the end um, submits a big PR, um, often that may be in conflict with, with the roadmap. Um, but we're extremely open to these contributions and to your point, I think any open source, um, any successful open source project um, is only successful if there's more contributors than the original people that created it because that's the strength of open but, source. But are you open for fundamental changes in the architecture that makes it from something that designed for more of a, you know, a local uh, computation to serve cluster computation that does require sometimes fundamental change mm -hmm. in the architecture yep. and you cannot just say, okay, let's add a parameter to one of the... Yep. Yeah, I think uh, we're, uh, I would say we're definitely open to like discussing what those changes would be. Um, depending on how significant they are, they would probably like happen with a major version um, change, right? Because we do semantic versioning. Okay. Um, but that's something where our like uh, engineering leadership would like most likely engage and, and discuss some of those options. Good. Uh, so, so let's talk a minute, you know, so there are a bunch of cloud services and they were being widely used, you know, someone going to uh, Amazon will probably go and use uh, SageMaker and a bunch of other data uh, related products, someone uh, going to uh, Azure, you know, you, you, you guys will probably try and convince it to use Azure ML and, and those uh, platform and, and even with, with Google, there are different flavors of ML and AI products, I'm not sure, uh, dumbing down the level of, uh, you know, uh, abstraction so people can just like throw a bunch of images, get back a model. Uh, so where do you see the, the differences or advantage of, or of using a managed cloud service? E each one of you have a managed cloud service as, as well uh, versus using uh, those frameworks that in sometimes, sometimes even overlap the same functionality. Um, well, you know, I mean, I, I think that every cloud is going to have, um, you know, an entire portfolio of services that they're going to want to um, uh, you know, offer to their customers. And, and many times it will be kind of a monolithic whole that, that works, you know, as a single thing. Uh, but I think more often than not, um, what uh, folks are looking for is to pick and choose. Um, uh, without question, the majority of uh, uh, data science that's going on today is going on on-premises somewhere, right? The data is being collected and stored, um, you know, it, it just, and, and that, that's just a microcosm of of the majority of workloads, period, are, are still not on the cloud, right? Uh, $1.7 trillion in IT spend a year, and, and uh, all the cloud providers added up together, you know, make well, well south of $100 billion. So the majority of that spend is, is still not in the cloud, and the question is, how does it migrate over? Um, at Azure, we, we certainly took a very SDK-first approach, so, um, uh, you know, we're trying very hard to let you pick and choose uh, oh, you just want to use data drift or you just want to use model profiling or something like that. It's a single API call. Uh, you can call out and call back. Um, and that, because we have that flexibility, uh, you can deploy a full Kubeflow pipeline on-prem and call out to our service uh, and just use, for example, managed inference or model profiling and then call right back in. And, and the exact same thing with MLflow, right? At the end of your MLflow, uh, you're using MLflow and at the end you just want to use uh, Azure Machine Learning for inference, great. It's a single API call and you're able to do that. And Can so you also do the other way around, like using a pipeline tool in, in Azure a AI and calling a... Absolutely, um, uh, I, I didn't have a chance, I didn't have enough time to, in my demo today, but I have a GitHub repo that specifically does that. So using Azure, it calls out to Kubeflow in this case, and it could easily call uh, on-prem uh, or, or Spark hosted ML flow, uh, executes there and then, then comes back. So nice. um, uh, I, I think that that is the, majority of the way you will see a lot of these workflows happening because 
um, uh, there are things around gravity, uh, whether or not it's um, uh, compliance gravity because of I need to be in Europe, uh, and that, that's where GDPR is, or my data is uh, hosted in this data center, where you'll have a lot of these cross um, uh, environment kind of like uh, workflows that need centralization. I think I'll answer this on a like higher altitude. Um, may maybe I'm avoiding the question, but I think there is a. I don't like avoiding my question. <laughs> well, then you, you can ask, ask a, a follow-up question. A uh, yes. way, you know? um, <laughs> I think the so I've worked at, at Google a couple of years in, in, in AI infrastructure, right? And, and I've seen what's happened in open source and also in the managed uh, ML offerings on all of the clouds. And I think we're at a stage in the life cycle of of these tools where. Um, I don't think we've, we've come up with the right levels of abstractions, the right like, layers of technologies, the right form factors of what should a data science and machine learning platform look like, right? There's uh, like opinionated versions of this like on all of the cloud providers. Um, but I think we're still in the, in the expansion uh, time frame where like there's like more and more startups that are like trying their, their approach. And at some point there's gonna happen like this like consolidation where we actually land on something that's gonna be um, the best way to go forward. And uh, like one of the examples that I like to use is, um, I remember when like 15 years ago or longer, um, when I was looking into CRM tools, there were like all kinds of like open source CRM tools. I didn't like any of them, so I just develop, developed my own with a bunch of people. And I think right now, like anyone would say that like Salesforce has, has like gotten to like the best form factor, or at least it's the most dominant CRM solution out there, right? And I think, uh, what Salesforce is to CRM, like uh, I want to see what that is for machine learning and data science platforms, right? Like I have an opinion on this and I have a conviction and also like uh, <laughs> I took a, a biased uh, opinion by joining Databricks. Um, but I think that's, that's really um, yet to be figured out. And I think any platform where you, um, that like narrowly just adopts one opinion is probably um, going to be a riskier choice than if you when if you use a set of tools that are more open, mm -hmm. uh, that are more portable, that run on multiple clouds, um, where uh, there's like still um, option left in terms of like hey where do you take your workloads or like where do you move so you're forward? You're suggesting not use SageMaker or <laughs> excuse me. So you're suggesting not use SageMaker? Uh, no, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that at all. Uh, actually, SageMaker. A lot of our customers use SageMaker. Um, so the the Databricks customers who are uh, deployed on AWS often use SageMaker for deploying their models, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm just saying that uh, all of those also have some workloads where they train uh, on-prem, where they train on a laptop, where they train on mm -hmm. Databricks, right? Like there's like still so much diversity that there is not a solution yet where you can consolidate all of your machine learning and data science. You sort of skipped the question, but. Oh, well, <laughs> you skipped me for the last question, which was the only question that I wanted to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I think that, um, well, I, I'm actually kind of more interested personally in figuring out at what point, like you're talking about convergence, um, is it going to be a technology convergence or is it going to be a convergence of the way that, um, that data science is done within organizations? Because I think the, like, the usefulness of a tool like Kuplo, you know, we're m much more right now, at least, uh, providing experience for data engineers and like ML ops. Um, you're providing a really great experience for you know the the data scientist. Um, and I'm wondering at what point uh, what tool is landed on it is going to be about the evolution of the rules um, that we're seeing within organizations. Like, will the data scientists learn more Kubernetes principles because they're expected to produce um, uh, models that are performant in production environments? Or will data engineers like uplevel themselves and use these, you know, frameworks to provide like really self-serve um, experiences for machine learning um, professionals? So yeah, I, yeah. I don't have watched some of the uh, Simon Wardley's uh, uh, talks, but essentially what he's saying that always the abstraction goes up; it never goes down. So right. that sort of if it if it answers your question, I think it means that sort of like abstraction will go up and sort of data scientists will win. If that, if with I, that analogy. I, I think it's a, it's a, Taylor just said like just an absolutely salient point, which is um, I think we've really 
abandoned data scientists um, uh, in, a, in a really bad place, which is um, this is just software engineering. It's software development. And we've given them an entirely set of new tools, an entire set of uh, new software practices, um, and, and kind of like left them on an island without you know, the basic frameworks that, you know, software develop that make software developers so productive today. Um, and, and I love the idea that, that Taya just said, which is how do we help them, maybe not transform, bring their knowledge in, but allow them to do the things that software developers do today. Um, that doesn't mean they need to go understand, you know, libraries and SDKs and, and you know, traveling salesman algorithms, but it does mean giving them the tools you know, standard limping, linting, compilation frameworks, um, yep. uh, you know, a higher level, I don't, I don't know about object-oriented design, but you get the idea. Like, yep. like, give them higher level tools that let them build things without having to, you know, guess whether or not this cell in a Jupyter notebook is executed twice or not. Sure. Um, so, so maybe to another question. So I, again, we came back and back to the same point that you sort of each one had a different design perspective. So let's assume we want to make an LP and converge those things. Uh, first, are you guys open to essentially uh, working together on, you know, there are also other challenges, uh, bigger fish to fry, you know, uh, David has his own personal agenda around ML spec, which is, uh, I, which I admire, by the way, on uh, essentially trying to create. I am uh, conniving. <laughs> uh, which is trying to also standardize the way you, you store artifacts and you, uh, you deliver a sort of common model. So how do we uh, essentially take all, take all those great opinions? So uh, even us, when we talk to customers, sometimes they say, uh, give me a MO flow on Kubeflow. We we'll say, oh, okay, that doesn't really work. But so we, but we do understand that there are different personas. Maybe someone works with uh, Spark and Databricks, sort of a fan of uh, ML flow. Another guy that comes from Ops and comes from you know TensorFlow or Deep Learning and Kubeflow says, I'm in love with this thing. Uh, so how do we take all those efforts of ML spec, ML flow, Kubeflow, and we work together as a community to, yeah, you know, we can wait for the dust to settle, which is one one way of doing it. Uh, or we could be a little more proactive and, and try and each one of the, of the groups, including us and others, uh, essentially work together towards the goals of at least making things closer. So when I'm, as a developer, I write code, I don't have to say for which platform. I, I could say, oh, it's pretty similar. You know what, I'll, I'll put some wrapper around it and you know, I could work with both. So if I, if I can say it's on you. Not on okay. us, <laughs> and and all of you out there. You know I'm working hard on. I know, but, <laughs> but but you said it, and and Clemens said it. It is these want all these problems want to be customer driven, right? We all would love to work together. There's nothing stopping us, really. We promise, except clear customer use cases. So come say, Databricks, you can sell a customer if you do the following. You know Google, Azure. You can sell a customer if you do the following: bring these together, draw clean lines, and and so, the teams So we will need the help them. of the crowd yes. here after, afterwards Please. to sort of beat you guys up. Absolutely. To say you guys need to collaborate more. That's our identify. So heard identify that? the what? scenario, whatever <laughs> it is, and and we think we know, but we're not going to design in a vacuum, okay. right? Again, the the reason <laughs> we did this, each of us, was because we all saw clear customer needs around these specific things, and we understood those customer needs in order to develop a solution. And once we were done, walk out and say, hey, did you solve it? Yes, no, okay, we can make tweaks. We can't design for the, the vacuum. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of one of the points of about Kubeflow is it's very easy to try to boil the ocean, you know, and solve like everything for every single framework. Um, one of the ways we develop in Kubeflow is um, by defining like a couple of core sets of customer user journeys that kind of try to define how the user experience should look like. And then we work back from that um, often. And one of the things that I think we benefit hugely from is getting more um, feedback on those user experiences, more people kind of coming to us with requirements about like what needs to be able to plug when um, in order for them to be able to get a new use out of the tooling. So um, I think I just had somebody come up to me um, at the Kubeflow booth downstairs um, chatting about 
um, how you know Airflow could potentially fit into an end-to-end -end, like use case with Kubeflow, um, and that was the first time that I'd actually heard someone mention that. And the first thing that I wanted to do is like, please write down your use case, email it to me, and we'll, we'll you know we'll start to collect these. But um, it's really easy, as David mentioned, to to do nothing well if you're trying to design in a vacuum and just you know making sure that every potential use case is suited. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think uh, David and Tia said it well. Um, and I just want to make like one, one final comment, which is you started your question with, uh, what if we made peace? Um, <laughs> that implies that there is no peace. Like, I, I think like, there is definitely peace. Like, we all know each other. We're all good friends, and we communicate. So I think that's, that's great. Um, and then the second observation that I just wanted to. I just to come from the Middle East for <laughs> 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 Right. You don't assume peace. Um, uh, and then the second thing that I just wanted to mention uh, also as a like, side note, uh, but actually going to do is, um, I think I'm going to register like disambiguating flow.com. Um, because actually I was, at Strata, I was at Strata earlier today and like someone asked me, what is the difference between TensorFlow, Airflow, and Kubeflow? Right. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I think the, all of the flows need to be disambiguated. Um, and I also think that like, to the point of like, the overlap, there's actually not that much overlap between all of these projects. Um, but it needs to be clear like what each one of those are trying to achieve. Right? Okay, so uh, final uh, words. Can each one sort of tell us what's, what to expect? Sort of, uh, sorry? Audience question? Uh, sorry? Audience. Yeah, so final question yeah. for you guys. Uh, but uh, roadmap, what's coming up next, you know, the next uh, few months for, e for each framework? Um, yeah, so for MLflow, um, as mentioned earlier, we're actually getting a lot of uh, contributions from the community. So I think in terms of uh, Kubernetes support, um, I do think we, we are engaging a lot with uh, people who add support for like running MLflow projects on Kubernetes, uh, deploying models uh, in containers on Kubernetes clusters. So I think that's definitely something that we're um, following um, the, the road on. And as mentioned, that's mostly community driven. In terms of the core components, uh, there's going to be uh, like a bigger announcement in a couple of weeks in Amsterdam. So like uh, anyone who finds themselves in Amsterdam on October 15th, um, stop by at the Spark AI Summit. Um, we've mentioned this in the past uh, that we're working on a component called Model Registry uh, that's going to extend uh, the support for the um, ML ops or like the, the um, ML lifecycle from logging models to managing the deployment lifecycle um, all the way to the deployment and then like bringing it back. Um, and that's like a big uh, area of investment for us and we're gonna announce more in October. Yeah, um, so we're coming up soon um, on our 0 0.7 release for Kubeflow. I think anyone who saw Josh's talk today um, probably is up to date on the existing feature set. We added a lot um, with 0 0.6 um, artifact tracking um, and, and some pipelines updates. Um, but 0 0.7 is essentially going to be, you know, our beta for considering um, a 1.0 uh, version. And um, the, whole, the whole thought is let's make sure that the APIs um, for our core components are stable, that we have really um, done all the final polishing on some of the enterprise support features, um, making sure that the on-prem use case is really solid um, support for multi-user. Um, finishing up with some of our case on it to, um, to oh gosh, what's the other one called? Thanks. <laughs> Customize work. Um, and also finalizing the Istio integrations. So um, not, not the most exciting thing, but the exciting thing is that um, we're getting ready to, to call um, Kubeflow and some of the core components of the communities cool. let us know our solid 1.0 earlier next year. No, nothing to add. Just try out Kubeflow 0.7 and let us know if it's 1.0 already. Yeah, please try it. <laughs> <Now>. um. <laughs> sure. So let's uh, now open up, open it up for the crowd. Anyone wants to ask them some hard questions? And uh, anyone? Uh, yep.
I'm not sure I understood what sort of the actual question, but you guys did. Uh, so I, I think the question was, um, uh, these are both very complete solutions, and you're looking for just a point solution that, that solves an individual component. Uh, it, did I roughly get that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so first, uh, let me uh, be a uh, uh, advocate for MLflow. Like MLflow is one command, and you're running on your local laptop. So uh, it is a wonderful getting started experience. There's no question. As much as I would love to say Kubeflow is there, it's not there. You have to install a local version of Kubernetes, which is tough, and then you, you subscribe to a whole bunch of components. Totally agree or with or that, too. Or you take our managed cloud right. to get it. Um, that said, um, many folks are using core components that are built for Kubeflow as point solutions. So for example, uh, one of the most common things, I think we have more downloads of the TensorFlow CRD from Kubeflow than we do for the Kubeflow whole platform, right? Uh, because it is a very well tested, very well understood, distributed platform for running TensorFlow. And I think you can pick and choose these kind of things very easily from both of these platforms. Um, it does require a little bit of understanding of the platform and configuration in order to do it properly, where you're not just you know, selecting things and then it just breaks. Um, but part of what you're subscribing to with the whole platform is something that has been end-to-end -end tested uh, for both of these platforms. And you know, though it feels like a lot, I would probably bias towards downloading the whole thing and using it as is, using just the components you want, rather than selecting one component of it and, and going to town. Because these are two teams that are working incredibly hard to make sure that end-to-end -end experience is good. And if you just peel out one, I think you might miss out on, on some of the goodness. Yeah, I think maybe to add specifically on, on Kubeflow, on, on the Guazio platform, there is a managed Kubeflow as part of it. And we don't just take everything because it's, again, too hard. There are also issues. Like if you are, in a, let's say, an enterprise or you're building an enterprise solution, then you already have an API gateway with authentication, authorization. You cannot just go and take the Kubeflow uh, thing as is. Or if you, for example, you want to provide managed uh, notebooks or Jupyter, then maybe you have all sorts of ways of customizing images, et cetera, which are not supported. So it's a, what we're doing in our platform where we don't take the whole thing, and we just like break it to pieces, we commercialize each one independently, and we had sort of uh, the other glue. And when people sort of ask about KF Kaggle, I said that's nice for sort of beginners if you really want to adopt it as a platform for your organization, break it down to YAMLs and or uh, customize now, <coughs> et cetera, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yep. So you have, a, again, you have an HPC cluster without GPUs? With GPUs, okay. And, and you cannot install Kubernetes on the sort of the other cluster with GPUs? You cannot do that? Uh, okay, any ideas? I mean, I think the, um, there's like, there, there need to be well-defined contracts uh, across a pipeline, right? And I think the deployment case is like pretty well defined in, in most cases, right? You can train your machine learning model on one platform that is that has GPUs enabled, uh, serialize that model in a format in whatever format is that is native to the framework, right? So let's say you use TensorFlow, um, you can lock that, uh, you can uh, like serialize that model in a TensorFlow safe model format, and then the deployment of it. Uh, can happen completely independently, even if you don't have GPUs, you can build it in a Docker container, put it on Kubernetes. So I think that contract between training something and then you pass off that um, artifact to be deployed is well defined in most cases. Um, I think there's other like more um, esoteric like hybrid uh, configurations that you can think of, but at least training deployment to me is, is pretty, um, pretty straightforward. And at least from the ML flow perspective itself, um, as mentioned earlier, we have use, use cases where uh, you have your MLflow tracking server running in one place, and like Databricks provides one managed version of this, and you can run your workloads locally and log to that server, 
you can run your workloads locally and on cloud um, and like on-prem deployments and log everything to a single place. So all of those hybrid configurations actually exist. L let me take this opportunity to say, just a, uh, extending on, on Clement's contract um, comment, uh, we have a, a, a very, very nascent project underway right now called ML Spec, uh, which is getting a lot of people working to establish some of these standard contracts. Uh, one of the first, uh, most successful ones right now is a project called KF Serving. Uh, it's got KF in the name, but we're trying to change that to ML Serving or some neutral thing because it's not Kubeflow specific. Um, but it, it is in Kubeflow. It now. is in Kubeflow. <laughs> <laughs> I have an issue. Please vote on it. Please <laughs> vote for By it to way, be changed even, uh, from Kubeflow. Workbook, for example, right. uh, that we use uh, a lot for MPI jobs, yeah. is part of the Kubeflow project, but we, in many cases, people just download exactly. and, and run it. But the idea is to establish, like, what would it look like if, as an industry, we established contracts between all of these various steps? Uh, Google's published many, many papers on all the steps of an ML platform, certainly what I stole my slides from, um, and, uh, and, and we would love to establish that as an industry, collaborate together and say, hey, you know what, for serving, here's a contract for you. For model packaging, here's a contract for you. For logging, here's a contract for you. Uh, and establish those things, and that now allows inner communication between um, uh, hybrid style environments. Okay, room for another? Or? We are out of time.